Hello, everybody. I'm so excited to have y'all here today. Uh, we are talking about raising uh, children with disabilities uh, on your own, going solo with it. And I'm super excited today to have Dr. Laura Marshak, who has written a gazillion books. This is the one we're focusing on today. Ooh, can you see it? There it is, Going Solo, Raising Children <clears throat> with Disabilities. And uh, you know, Dr. Marshak has already done one webinar with us and it was on uh, raising children with disabilities when you're married. And she's just fantastic. Uh, she's just fantastic. So uh, what I'd like to do is just kind of shorten this intro and let her get to it. So she has plenty of time. Okay, guys, here we go. All set? Yes, thank you. Good. So um, uh, Lindy had mentioned that I had written other books before, and um, I saw this as my last book, and I wanted to both put in uh, most everything I knew about how to live life well when you're in a complicated situation. And I also very much wanted to learn from other people this time. I was kind of tired of reading my own words and hearing my own thoughts. So, so I decided to write this book going solo. And um, as much as some of the information applies to people in couples, as Lindy referred to, um, I think that when someone is doing it on their own, uh, it calls for even um, greater use of coping skills. Um, and we'll go over many of those today. So um, as you can see uh, on this first slide, I think what is different is that sense, it's all on me and my children need so much for me. And I know that can happen in some non-functional marriages, but it very much happens, of course, when you're going solo. Um, we often, or people who are doing it on their own, often look around and see everybody in couples, but actually almost a third of parents of kids with disabilities on their own. So let, let me talk a little bit about the methodology for this book, because uh, I'm going to draw on a lot of the words of other people as we progress through the PowerPoint, and I want you to understand who they are. So uh, as I had said, I wanted to learn from other people, especially people who were going solo. So um, I put ads everywhere, including on Craigslist. Anybody who was willing uh, to talk to me uh, in person, or actually on the phone, but I think they all ended up in person, I would go see them. So I, I uh, drove to Florida, I drove here and there and sat down with all kinds of people that I had such a fortune to meet. Um, in addition, I had uh, an online survey where hundreds of other people shared their thoughts. So um, all told, I ha uh, had 43 people um, uh, that I personally interviewed and they ran the gamut of never married, deciding to have children on their own or adopt children, divorced, widowed. Um, yeah, so that's who you'll be hearing from uh, hopefully as much as you'll hear my own words during this presentation. And my framework for thinking about, about this book and my goal for it was to share the wisdom of other people. You know, I thought about that quote uh, from Albert Ellis who said, everybody is a genius at something. So I structured the book so that people would share their genius strategies. And uh, of course I worked in my own thoughts as well. Next slide, please. Andy. So most of the quotes will be from other people, but there are two quotes that um, I hold dear. Um, one is by Viktor Frankl, who was a psychiatrist um, who lost most of his family uh, in the concentration camps during the Holocaust. And uh, when he got out, he wrote the very famous book, uh, I think it's Man's Will to Meaning. Um, and his quote, which has really influenced my thinking is, between stimulus and response, meaning what happens to us and what we do, there is a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our, lies our growth and freedom. And so my goal in writing the book 
And in doing this talk and in a lot of my individual work is for people to exercise their freedom to live the best quality of life, even when circumstances are really, really complicated. So I love what Viktor Frankl said, and I also love what Virginia Satir said. Uh, she's, a, um, she's a very famous family therapist, and she said, life is not what it's supposed to be. It is what it is. And it's not that that is so novel, right? We've all heard that phrase, it is what it is. But if you really take it in, it reminds us um, to remember that, um, quote, good people don't always get easy lives, right? And we're often fighting that. So um, we get the path we get and we need to walk it well. And that's what I'll be talking about today, sharing other people's wisdom on it. Um, and with that, I'll talk a little bit about self-care because that's a foundation, a good bit about managing emotions, um, issues pertaining to divorce, um, raising grieving children, uh, dating, and then I'll end with lessons from resilient solos and then some time for questions. Next slide, please. So um, as you think about walking your path, and we all have individual paths, and I think we have them if we're married too, but I think that um, our aloneness um, is amplified when we're doing it solo. Remember that many other people have walked that same path, even if you don't see them. And why underscore that is, Often we feel alone and we look around our life and say, how in the world am I ever going to do this? And then you see there are other people doing it and doing it well. Um, and I'll be quoting many of those people today. Okay. So the starting point in that path, and I referred to a little bit when I commented on the value of what Virginia Satir said, is we often, um, really married or, or solo, but probably even more solo, the starting point often when there's childhood disability or illness or other things that happen in life is what did I do to deserve this? You know, that notion, as I said before, good things happen to good people. And so why, why did this happen to me? And so this is a quote uh, from one person who wrote it and said, uh, what did I do to deserve this? Why did that woman who was drinking and doing drugs have a perfectly healthy child well, I took such care to be healthy and had my child born with a disability. Why does she have an easier life while I have a harder life? Why are all these people happily married and I'm single? Why is my life filled with so much frustration, but theirs isn't? So that's often the starting point on this path. Cindy, the next slide, please. So, and you can see this path, I guess it's called a switchback. And it is like a lot of the paths in life, especially coping with really challenging situations. It's not a smooth path. You know, we make progress, we double back. So this is a quote, I think it's actually from the same woman who was questioning, why did this happen to me? In fact, I'm 95% sure. And she eventually wrote, um, I wouldn't trade one moment of this life with my children for any other life where they did not exist. I want to be the one who gets to love them. And I accept probably all of the frustration, anger, and stress for the opportunity to live this life with them. I can't cheapen that by comparing it to some al alternate reality that isn't mine. Um, and I... I love this expression of how she struggled with that and where she got to. Um, and many of the ideas in this PowerPoint should help you sort out this issue if you have not all already. You know, I, I'm not assuming you, the group of you listening have not made great progress with this, but I know it's not easy. Uh, and the exact path will differ from person to person. Next slide, please. So I want to start with self-care first because it's just not optional. And, um, and I know it can be a cliche about take care of yourself, um, 
but it's one of those things we can do that is somewhat simplistic and makes such a difference. And so um, I have those icons up there because if your car was on empty, you wouldn't try to drive it. And our energy levels can get on empty and, and we do more and more. And if you needed an oil change, you know it would ruin the vehicle. So you would do it no matter what else was going on. Somehow with self-care, when we are so busy with kids and a lot of um, pressure, uh, we skip those steps. So I wanna to touch on sleep, refusal to be consumed and support. Next slide, please. So, um, don't ignore sleep problems because um, if we are overly fatigued, and this is something we, we can address to some extent, it makes everything more difficult. And as a psychologist and working with psychiatric hospital for a long time, I, I know very well, as many of you may know, that um, lack of sleep leads to other problems such as depression, it's seen as kindling. And there's so many sleep strategies on the internet and you may know some of them and I am just simply saying, please use them. So I'm gonna to just touch on a few very quickly. These are the ones I do myself. Um, one is I, you prepare for sleep with some kind of ritual that signals for you that the day is coming to a close, right? For me, it's taking a half bath. It's different for different people, but it's beginning that wind down process. Um, I also suggest setting a quit, quitting time for life's work, and that includes the work of worrying. And there are all kinds of strategies about that. And um, when we talk more about working, uh, worry, I'll talk about what you can do with worry before bed. Um, being very careful with screens, computers and um, iPhones. And then there is so much on the web, some of which I use myself about if you can't sleep, what you can do, like become the protagonist in a story. So um, next slide, please. So that's sleep problems. This is a very important one. And it's one um, that makes a very large difference for people in the end. And it's that refusal to be consumed by what's going on with your child, except for during a crisis. During a crisis, uh, we're all consumed. So the first quote is from a mother uh, of a child who remains very medically fragile. And there have been some times uh, I know that she thought she was going to lose him. So she wrote, I'm still a very overprotective parent and I'm probably way more than I should be, but I decided I could not be consumed by her care. That is one of the reasons I decided I must always work. And this is not pro-work or anti-work. It's saying that she, um, she knew that she had to leave part uh, of her energy for the rest of life. So I'm gonna refer to myself for a minute and um, I think that there is great value in hobbies. And without going into any details, I've had to walk a path that included some very frightening things and some things that didn't have easy fixes. And my hobby has always been either stained glass or fused glass. So if there was nothing I could do about a bad situation, I'd sometimes go down in the basement, right? and think about what shade of blue glass I'm gonna use next. Should it be light blue, dark blue? It, may, it distracted me, it made me think of something else. And clearly glass is trivial compared to a child's well-being, but not being consumed is not trivial. Um, it's also better for a child, you know, there's a law of diminishing returns that if we hover over a child or make them all of life, um, it often puts a burden on them. Uh, in addition, kids often do get tired of being a central um, part of your life. 
And so for those of you that are able to leave them at home at times, it's really important that you do that. Okay, next slide, please. So I put support under self-care um, and I showed you how important sleep was. I think support probably is even number one. Um, and if you ever see the dedication in my book, uh, it wasn't to my husband, it was to my uh, best friend. So uh, friends are very powerful uh, when it comes to walking down that path. So this is, a re this is just a, a snippet from a research study, uh, which I think drives that point home really well. And it talked about, they would have people look at um, a steep upgrade of a hill. And, you know, they would ask the research participants, you know, how many degrees upwards do you think that slope is? And people who were standing there alone as they look up this, uh, slant of the hill. So it is much steeper than those that either had a friend by their side or even were able to think of a supportive friend. And so even mentally, having a supportive friend to think of, if not be by our side, uh, makes those hills or mountains we look at in life less steep. So I, I, I think um, that analogy is pretty good. Next slide, please. So this is one of my favorite quotes in the whole book. And it speaks to the value of um, including in your networks, people with kids with similar uh, disabilities or diseases. And um, so you'll see why I love this quote in a moment. So um, this is from a mother who said she was tired of, um, I think support groups are very valuable, but I think it's important to find the right one. And, and she said that when she joined some autism support groups, they were all what she called warrior mothers out to defeat autism. And she felt there was a lot of competition uh, about who was doing the most for their kids. So, so that didn't suit her. So then uh, she talked about, she found um, a different group of parents on the internet. That's one great thing about the internet who shared their struggles. And one of the things they did was have a contest to see who had their worst poop story, um, because there were many. And so her quote is, you know, the Fisher Price barn from the plastic farm set sadly did not win. The secret deposit on the bookstore shelf did. Those friends are priceless. And I, I could never say that better. Next slide, please. So a couple more that I think are really important. Um, somebody wrote me and said, I have a friend who gets it. That's what we're looking for. Other people would get it because she has children with disabilities too. Last summer I went over and she had a whole bowl of cut watermelon. We sat on her back deck and watched while our sons chased each other around her fenced yard. The other mother and I took turns reminding the boys to be safe and it was so nice. I was shocked when we finished off that whole bowl of watermelon. Not being the only adult on watch and having someone to talk to it was such a sweet, sweet, unanticipated, relaxing afternoon. And I included that and you'll hear me talk more about uh, the ability to change our focus. And I don't know what was going on with her before she joined that friend, but I am sure uh, a friend in a bowl of watermelon and not being alone with it was such a game, a powerful game changer in the moment. Um, from another woman, she said, and, and this speaks to friends and logistics, especially friends that have um, kids with disabilities. She said, if you can't risk trusting someone you don't know really well, you can consider swapping off with another parent who you do trust. And we'll see, I think that's a creative response and we'll see the role of creativity in walking that path well as, as we proceed further. Now, when I was working on preparing this PowerPoint, I tried to include everything um, that 
that Lindy wanted me to emphasize. And I know she had reached out to some people for their input. And there were two um, really great questions that were hard. And I thought about them. I thought I don't have a simple answer. And one was, uh, what do I do if I have to leave a child alone? And the other one, and these may be from the same person, was how not to expect too much um, from a sibling without a disability. And I thought about it a lot as I was preparing. Um, and I really think the answer in part is to be connected in a supportive way with enough other people, um, some on the ground, right? Beats on the ground, other parents, but even parents on the internet who have walked that path, right? I've known other parents who say, I fear leaving a child alone, but I don't know what else to do. And if your circle is wide enough and we'll see how some people do that, um, we're less likely to have to leave a child alone. So I think about it as diversified support. Next slide, please. So um, this is from Sam, who we'll see a few times. I happen to have put a chapter just for fathers in this book, because I think they even feel more alone at times. So um, he has a child with autism who's nonverbal, and, and I think that she's um, not totally trained yet either. Um, and he wrote, as my daughter gets older and bigger, and stronger and smarter, and I get older and weaker and dumber, how am I going to figure out how to take care of her? I've been thinking about puberty for years, but it's happening more quickly than I thought. She's strong as a bull and gets very physically aggressive. I usually have marks all over my body. I've lost a lot of caregivers. Obviously, it changed my life quite a bit. I did a long interview with him. I also know him. So, um, so these are just snippets. So he's talking about the situation that is really, really a hard one. And he doesn't have a lot of money and she is very physically aggressive and he is very alone with it. Uh, the mother um, has drug addiction and is not involved. So later on in the interview, he said, uh, the biggest thing that helped me is to surround myself with people who are bright so I can follow their lead. This is, and then I added, this is how he figured out how to get a $6,000 camera system for free so he could keep uh, his daughter safe and see her from every corner of the house. And um, I was part actually of a group of people. He, um, he just made himself be extroverted and he reached out to so many people and he convened a panel just to talk about his daughter's puberty because um, he was so without answers and alone with it. So I admire Sam for that. Next slide, please. Um, and it's about fathers and support. And it is harder for fathers. I think that Sam is a great example because he had to go out of his way to be really friendly and a massive group of people. And um, he has another child with a disability. He has a lot of physical pain. He has many other problems. And um, he, uh, so some of you um, who may be um, either shyer or feel you don't have the energy to do one more thing, such as be extroverted with other people, sometimes it pays off more often than not. It pays off big time and it's worth that energy. Uh, I also want to point out when, it, when I think about fathers, more organizations are recognizing fathers. The um, I uh, advise a disability inclusion group in Pittsburgh, and uh, we always had moms night out. Now we have fathers night out. There's much more recognition. It, it's long overdue. Um, and there are groups online. There is much more out there. Um, and I know some are state specific. The Washington Fathers Network has been around for years and is a marvelous resource. There's lots of other ones and I just added a few dads appreciating Down syndrome, dads for special kids Facebook groups, but I really uh, urge you to take that energy to look.
Next slide, please. So I want to talk about feelings. And when um, Victor Frankl talks about that space between stimulus and response, a lot of that has to do with what do we do with our feelings. I love this quote from Muji, which is, feelings are just visitors. Let them come and let them go. So this afternoon, I'm, I'm going to talk about just a little bit about worry and fear, managing sadness and self-pity, and anger. I'm saving that for the divorce section just so uh, I break it up a little bit more. But anger uh, certainly is something we all have to manage, uh, whether or not divorce is involved. So the, this little Venn diagram is something that's used a lot of dialectical behavior therapy that just really says to us, we want to operate out of wise mind. And you can see that in that Venn diagram. And it's a combination of the reasonable mind logic and the emotional mind. So my point is, our feelings really do help us be wise, but sometimes they're tricky to manage. Next slide, please. So I have three slides on worry. Uh, because that's probably um, just so common. This is a quote. Uh, I asked people who participated in the book, you know, how do you cope with worry? How do you cope with fear? How do you cope with anger? So these are some of their strategies. Uh, and one woman put it so well, she said, life is only made of moments. It's possible to miss life while waiting for it to be smooth. And then, of course, she said, we might as well wait for a unicorn to appear, meaning probably never, ne you know, probably never will life be smooth. Doesn't mean it can't be good, just won't be smooth. Uh, and someone else put, um, staying in the present makes life manageable, which is absolutely true. And um, I am uh, sure, I think you've all heard of mindfulness because every time I turn around and I hear about mindfulness and that is the art of staying in the present moment and as much as that may feel like cliche at time it is actually so so powerful so somebody once expressed it well to me when I was scared about something and they said Laura keep your head and your feet in the same place meaning stay in the present moment and now and then, if I get really worried about something, I say, oh, my thoughts, they're out ahead of me. They're, and I'll pull them back to the present moment and remind myself that maybe what I fear, for sure, hasn't happened yet. It may also never happen, right? That's keep your head and feet in the same place. You stay in the present moment. And um, my advice is, you moderate um, the amount of thinking about what if this happens? What if that happens, right? What if he doesn't get better? What if she relapses? What if she ends up um, needing to use a wheelchair? What if medically she gets worse and worse? And we may need a little bit of that thinking. We'll talk about it when we come to managing fear, but, um, people tend to do it throughout the day. And that's what I want you to moderate. And I would, um, you can tell I like research studies. This is another research study. I really like it came from it, which is they had participants um, think about the future and they lean into it. And the point that's important about that to me is even our body responds physiologically when our head is out to the future. All right, next slide, please. So um, there's a good book called The Worry Cure, but there are other good books. And this is probably where I got it from. We talked about separating productive from unproductive worrying. So some worrying is, is productive, right? So some what ifs we're fine with, but just some, because they can lead to good planning, facing our fears, um, 
some what if is often a step towards acceptance, especially when there's disorders that we expect to um, worsen. Unproductive worrying is another story. And that's that it, uh, for many of us, it becomes habitual. It becomes a well-worn habit. And part of the reason it does that is when we worry, we have the illusion of control. It's, it's like we think we're doing something about it. It's also research that says it keeps us from feeling our emotions because we're busy worrying. I argue that, that it's a, a huge waste of time in general, keeps us from processing our emotions and keeps us from enjoying the present in our own life or with our children. So there's a lot of um, good strategies out there for worry. And this may seem really odd to you, um, but it's helpful. And some will say, um, worry once. I could never just worry once, but I could work to contain my worry. Some will say, worry several hours before bed. You can write down everything you're worrying about. And then you, in essence, put it in a container. That's why you see two containers there. And you're done for the day, right? You're done with the work of worrying for that day. And you can take the lid off that container the next day and address that day. Um, some people also use a mental file cabinet, which I did myself when something pretty dreadful was going on and there was nothing more I could do. And I had to fly off and I actually think give the talk. And I, and I took my own advice as I took the worries, put it in a mental file cabinet, knew that when I got back to Pittsburgh, I'd address it. So next slide, please. So sadness and I know that you have had um there's sadness there's grieving I uh, and I know you had a good a good webinar on that and maybe even more than one so I'm going to touch on it lightly um this is a quote from a woman who participated and she said uh, for acute sadness Focus on the feeling for a predetermined amount of time. For example, give yourself 10 minutes or half an hour or whatever amount of time you feel is appropriate to think about how and why you feel sad. Crying may help you feel better and reduce levels of stress hormone. When you've reached your time limit, stop and focus on something else. Think of something that makes you happy or something that can distract you from your sadness. For example, jot down your grocery list, check your email, or do something else unrelated to what has made you sad. <laughs> and then I, I like her comment, repeat as needed. Um, next slide, please. And I'm going to go back and comment on her approach to sadness because you'll see that it, it jives really well with some of the strategies that follow. So uh, with Muji's quote, Muji said, all emotions are welcome as visitors. And one is sadness. And, we, and a lot of people who don't want sadness to visit. And I think self-pity, uh, personally, I think it's fine to welcome it as a visitor. And um, uh, so I wouldn't be afraid of them. But I keep them short, just like that other quote about the time limit for sadness. Keep them short. Now and then you can have a full day. Right. The value of them, if you feel like having them, and not everybody does, is if you suppress those feelings, they tend to grow. So, for example, Sam, who I mentioned before, he has quotes in the book about I keep walking and I don't look back and, and um, you know, God put eyes in the front of your head. So you look forward. That's how he walks the path. And I have a feeling he doesn't do much of the self-pity. But that doesn't mean for somebody else that's uh, that short, even frequent pity parties, doesn't mean that's not a good idea. And this holds true for fear too, that we need to also, um, some of you may let in a lot of fear, but there's some people who just don't want to go there. And um, 
I used to quote from my friend Lisa Green, who wrote an interesting book um, about medically fragile children. Uh, she's a mother of two children with cystic fibrosis. And um, oh, actually, that quote's not hers. The article is hers. She wrote an article, which you could find on the internet, not that says, um, don't let scary statistics rob you of joy. And so um, it's a little bit coaching you about if there are some scary, I don't quite want to call them facts, information um, or statistics about what outcomes can be. Let it in, but let it coexist with joy and mindfulness in other parts of life. Um, and then there's this other quote, which was from a participant for fears, listen to them, but not too much. I think she said it um, beautifully and in far fewer words than I just, all right, next slide, please. So uh, remember what, uh, when I talked about that quote, I like on sadness and she said limited to 10 minutes or 30 minutes. And I said, I have more to say about it. It's this slide and I think about a um, remote control. And the guidance is feel free to change the channel. Uh, and that means a channel in our mind. And what we focus on in life grows. And if we focus on um, scary things or things that are wrong, they get larger in our uh, mental landscape. Um, whereas there are other things to focus on too, we want to balance. And so this is a nice quote from a participant who said, we can endure the hard times, but forget how to enjoy the simple things like noticing the leaves on the trees. Another example from someone, for the negative emotions, um, I schedule my life so I have time to decompress. During the, years I, during the years that I struggled most, on my way to work or back, I would stop at a park and look into the trees or the water for 15 or 20 minutes and then head back home. I spent my day looking forward to such moments with nature. I fed the ducks stale bread. It's a great feeling when crows and ducks swarm down and take crumbs from your hand. You think of nothing but how majestic birds are when a flock is hovering over your head, swooping down that, and I wish I had a hat on. But she's saying every day, she this is self-care too, or most days she would structure her life so that in essence, the nature channel was right in front of her and she could immerse herself in that and not just troubles or worries or other things. And she picked something that would really engulf her. Next slide, please. So uh, let me talk a little bit about divorce. And I, and I put an asterisk by uh, Sadie's name. All the names I refer to, um, I've changed. So um, this is from such an interesting woman um, who appeared uh, um, timid and, and anxious. And uh, the more I learned from her, the more I understood that she could have those characteristics. But um, she was a powerhouse at deciding uh, that she was going to manage the situation. So a couple quotes from her. Uh, the hardest thing to cope with is when my son is being aggressive. I could lock myself in my room. Oh, okay, sorry. I can lock myself in my room, whereas before, meaning before the divorce, I could leave the house for 10 minutes. I sometimes need to hide myself in the room to calm down. It's a challenge with a child banging on my door, but I usually just find something I like to do. She's not changing the channel. I like to read. I like to listen to music. I like to sing. I really admire that going behind the door and doing what she needs to have a little bit of pleasure or to calm down. Um, and she also says there are good parts to divorce. She recognizes the good and the bad with a lot of situations. It's just so much calmer. I especially enjoy the evenings when my son goes to bed. I don't have his dad there asking get a, to get his back scratched or other things. It's just me at night. And that's also mindfulness, appreciating uh, what feels good about her situation. Next slide, please. 
So uh, in writing this book, I also tried to incorporate um, a few professional experts, the parents were experts too. And um, this was a neat little book I found written by a couple that used to be married to each other and they wrote it together. Uh, and uh, they have some marvelous points and I just wanna highlight a few. Uh, they wrote, regardless of what happened in the marriage or since the breakup, the child has a right to have a relationship with both parents if both are fit and willing without micromanagement or interference from the other parent. Divorce brings a lot of changes and uncertainty for children, but having a relationship with both parents is one thing they should be able to count on, enjoy, and not feel conflicted about. And in keeping with this, they also wrote, at the same time that you're burying this relationship, meaning the marriage, your post-breakup relationship is being born. Imagine that your, quote, dead relationship is a zombie threatening the newborn infant that is your post-breakup partnership. Protect the partnership just as you would that infant, meaning the co-parenting partnership. Keep them separate and apart so that the parent partnership has a chance to thrive and tainted by any residual bitterness and unresolved hurts from the old relationship. And I think that's great advice. I do appreciate now and then um, a, a parent is not fit on, on a large scale, but this is for people that are in the ballpark um, of uh, adequacy as a parent. Next slide, please. So a piece of this, how do you protect that infant co-parenting relationship? And how do you um, uh, operationalize seeing that the child has the right to feel secure with both parents, right? You have to control what you say about your ex because you might be really angry and hurt or just troubled by them. So um, these are three quotes on that topic by participants. One said, and, and this one comes up like if the child says, I'm gonna go visit daddy Saturday. Um, she wrote, I generally focus on my child's thoughts. If she's excited that her dad is coming, I may say something like, you're so excited, just five more days. Nothing about him, but reflecting the child's happiness. Second one, I love this one. I didn't speak negatively about him. I knew my son would figure it out on his own. And I think that's really wise. And third, children with disabilities need to know they are safe and secure in every situation. If parents talk negatively about the other parent, they will miss out on that security when they're on visitation. That's an important one. Next slide, please. So uh, I say some about anger uh, for divorce. And, you know, um, I was thinking about anger. I'm sure I'm not the first to think about it like fire. So some anger, like some flames are really useful, but flames can go out of control. They can burn things we don't want burned. We can self combust probably. So um, from a participant, she wrote, use anger to give you energy to do what needs to be done to resolve the situation that's making you angry. You can also use the energy to do something useful like cleaning the house or pulling weeds. And I'm gonna go back to that second part just in a moment, it's really good advice. Anger, when that flame is about this high, is really good at getting us to act um, on situations that need to be resolved. However, too much anger blocks creativity and it's hard to problem solve uh, creatively or feel your other emotions if you're full of anger. And anger is also a real cover for sadness sometimes. So, um, so for most people, uh, there's a call for some anger management. In general, in the psychological or self-help literature, talk about three components to handling, managing anger. And those of you that are more interested can find a lot one is there's a physical component, right? Because of the stress that builds up. So when this woman wisely said, I think it's a woman, it could be a man. Um, uh, 
use the energy to do something useful like cleaning the house or pulling leads, it's to discharge that physical tension. Um, then there's self-talk because we tend to feed anger with our thoughts, which is how dare she, how could they, I can't believe. And that self-talk feeds it and feeds it. The other thing with anger is that it's an overlearned habitual routine that needs to be interrupted. And so that's like that changing the channel of, you know, maybe I'm not going to rant and rave for half an hour. Maybe I'll do something else and learning to interrupt um, those habitual routines. Next slide, please. So um, I interviewed in the book maybe there are five or six different people with different kinds of marriages, some that had cooperative, semi-cooperative spouses, some where uh, there was no way they could co-parent with them because, um, well, like Sam's situation. I don't think he probably knew where his wife was. So, but for Betsy, she had a spouse um, uh, that, love their children and um, who had the best intentions. I do think I start her story with something like who was on a cruise with another woman four weeks after the divorce papers were signed. So it's not that she was without anger, but it's my words. I'm not the first one, it's probably Martin Luther King or something who said, keep your eye on the prize. But you know, I think about that often in life, but what is it I really want? And in this case, what we want is what's best for the kids. So she would keep her eye on what was best for the kids, even though she had some emotions. So she set about getting him to be successful uh, parenting um, uh, so that she could minimize his defensiveness if she made any suggestions. So she said, I think we had success because he would never feel threatened opening up to me about things. And because I'd say, well, you need to do X, Y, and Z and not be little in his child rearing. It was just different tactics on how to parent this difficult child. So she really helped him shape up his skills. And she did talk in the book about how she really felt he was a much better parent uh, than before the divorce. Next slide, please. So, you know, this theme of freedom runs throughout this PowerPoint in a way. That's why I liked Victor Frankl's quote about we have the freedom to respond the way we want. And Virginia Satir also wrote about freedom, uh, and she specified five. And um, before I, I touch on them, I want to say um, because divorce shakes up the status quo, um, you can claim a lot of freedoms you may not have felt you had before. And so she includes the freedom to see and hear what is there instead of what should be, was, or will be. It speaks to denial, wishful thinking. The freedom to say what one feels and thinks instead of what one should. The freedom to feel what one feels instead of what one ought. The freedom to ask for what one wants. I love this one. Instead of waiting, always waiting for permission. And the freedom to take risks on one behalf instead of choosing to be only secure and not rocking the boat. Next slide, please. So I want to touch on, I have a, a chapter on. Um, bereaved parents. And um, I'm thinking probably two were men and then there are a few women in there. This is a man who um, uh, I met from Craigslist and a really um, beautiful man in, in um, how he adapted to life. Um, and he has two children, one with Marfan's uh, disorder, um, and uh, his daughter has some serious cardiac problems from it. And one child with deafness, and he never knew how to communicate with the son with deafness because his wife was in charge. I mean, that wasn't a good thing, but that just was. He was a breadwinner and um, 
she raised the children. So she died suddenly. And so he had these two children. And I think he worked something like 100 miles away from the home. One child. Uh, he didn't know ASL. He didn't know how to communicate with. And um, you'll see at the end when I talk about people's resilience, people really are wired to be resilient uh, and walking that path with certain conditions like support. And um, I think this quote is from about a year, a year and a half, two years. It's two years after he suddenly lost his wife. He said, I now realize that life is temporary and it's going to end. I ask myself, do you want to do something that is significant with the kids or are you just going to let it pass? Now I think about how Lindsay used to enjoy life and live like there was no tomorrow. She was a bigger kid than the kids. Sometimes that irritated me, uh, but now I see it differently. I want to do things with the kids and I'm looking forward to the summer. I'm running an RV for a week and taking the kids Stone Mountain, Six Flags Over Georgia, Gatlinburg, Pigeon Ford, Forge in Dollywood. Uh, we've been talking about doing this since my wife died over two and a half years ago. That's how long it's been. And something has always seemed to get in the way of us going. This July, we were doing it, and he did. And I titled this one, uh, um, Learning That Grief and Joy Can Coexist Well. And so his genius strategies really had to do with letting grief and joy coexist. Uh, next slide, please. So um, Paul lost his wife after a long, long illness. I think he took care of her for maybe 15 years. And uh, Paul has one son, Eli, who has pretty significant autism. And what uh, I admired about Paul, he's also someone uh, I've known over time, is that as much as he was grieving with a broken heart, he worked with Eli with Eli's grief and he did it in creative adaptive ways since being on the spectrum, some more conventional ways of communicating wouldn't work. So he was creative. And he also worked very hard um, as did the man on the last slide about staying connected with the children's mother or their wife in creative ways. Um, so the last slide, I didn't say it, but that man would say, Lindsay, you know, you thought you'd be done with co-parenting and you're not. And so she became his co-parent from, um, from the great beyond. And, um, and I think that's very adaptive. And so he worked with Eli to stay connected with his mother too. And did things like the balloons are there because, you know, they sent his birthday wishes to his mother and Eli could understand that. Um, <clears throat> I did some exploring when I was writing this section because so many people skip the grief of uh, kids that are not uh, neurotypical. Uh, and there are some resources out there like the PEC system, picture exchange system. There are some that facilitate grief counseling. There are also some resources on the web. I list a few in the book, but you could get them from the web. The bigger point here is to be creative about it. You know, I, I'm working with a mother whose uh, husband also died suddenly, and her son is nonverbal, and um, uh, and uh, has been very alone in his grief, and um, and Paul exemplifies kind of leaning into it and figuring it out. Next slide, please. So Paul, um, uh, this will lead us into dating. So I wanna talk about Paul and Melanie and they um, met actually at, at uh, Friendship Circle where I advise. And when we have activities, uh, the parents hang out in this, lounge area, sometimes they participate. So Paul and Melanie would hang out with their, um, after having brought the respective kids 
So that's how they met. But my interview with Paul and Melanie was before they started dating. So Paul, when he was talking about the prospect of dating, he said, I had, I had a conversation a while ago with a neighbor who asked me, do you see yourself getting married again? I looked at her and said, you got to be kidding me. Who wants me? I'm an overweight, bald guy with a disabled kid and I'm old. Um, and then he talked about meeting, you know, Melanie hanging out, watching the kids. And he said, when she told me the story about how they were test tube babies and how she wanted to have them, I said to myself, that's a strong person to go through that. I was so impressed. So I think I have a chapter in the book about um, parents by choice, some single women who decide to solo women to have children. So, so that's Paul, then there's Melanie. And she said, um, people are constantly pushing me to have someone else to share my life with, but I also have huge fears about sharing my boys. They're mine, 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 a hundred percent mine. Uh, when I do go out, one of my sons will say, you don't want to be with us. Why don't you want to be with us? My head is still a hundred percent consumed by my boys but they're just beginning to be a little bit more independent. I can't imagine co-parenting or having someone discipline my boys, even if the discipline was totally respectful and called for. Uh, then I recognize I'm jumping 17 steps ahead of myself, right? She got her head back to work with Peter. So that was their starting point. Next slide, please. So, so they met and then I forgot who said which thing, but it's from them. Uh, we said from the beginning that the first priority had to be the kids. If they weren't going to get along, there'd be no sense pursuing a relationship. It wouldn't mean we couldn't be friends. By the way, both of her children have autism. So together it's three children with autism. Um, and one of them said, we started this way of dating in May, meaning with the kids, and it took until August for us to have our first date by ourselves. About 75% of the time we have kid dates, but we have enough adult time to keep it going. The kids are at the point where they want us to get married tomorrow. And they did get married and it has been a really good marriage. It's been several years now. They show up, you know, friendship circle together and um, so for them that really worked. Next slide please. So a little bit on dating. Um, there are several people I interviewed that did find lasting romantic love. Um, uh, I, I can't remember how many but maybe of the interviews I probably probably included three or four. Um, so it, it's possible, uh, uh, but they did it carefully. And uh, you can see, I, uh, I put this in large font. <laughs> Don't lower the bar for what you expect from someone or ignore red flags because you fear no one will want you with your circumstances. And I think that's one of the bigger risks. You know, it's like when Paul said, who would want me? And um, uh, a lot of people carry that whether or not you're solo with kids with disabilities. And um, oh, yeah. so you can't lower the bar or ignore it facts. So advice from participants, one wrote, uh, always make sure and do background checks. People can always say they're a good person, but can have a closet full of secrets. Uh, that can, and it's really easy to do, um, needing to do background checks. To me, that's not the world's worst idea. I don't have to be a paranoid person, but I do know, uh, and, you, and you probably know it too, that um, uh, when you have a vulnerable child, it tends to attract some good people and some in-between people and uh, sometimes predators. So um, another piece of advice was make sure that anyone you date knows up front that your child is always first. It's hard, but it can be done. Right now, I have someone who's wonderful and amazing to myself and my children. Next slide, please. So we're almost at the end. I know this has been a bit long. Um, 
have a chapter on resilience, and this is just one of several people from it. It's also someone I know. And um, she was uh, 64 when um, she became a solo parent. She'd been divorced and actually uh, she lived a peaceful life in this big old house and she liked to read and do this and that. And, and um, she'd done really well um, adjusting to the solitude from her divorce. She loved it. And, um, but suddenly she became so apparent for four grandchildren all on the spectrum. And you can see their ages, three, five, seven, and nine. Um, their mother had died and um, suddenly, and her son was in, uh, incapacitated the way many, some people are. And so she had no choice but to take them in. And I think she took them in immediately. I know she took them in immediately. So um, there's a long interview with her, uh, but she wrote, uh, or she said to me, I transcribed it. Living alone for 12 years, I really liked my silence that I didn't have it anymore. And so I needed to have time where I could just chill out or do some things I needed to do to keep me happy. I wasn't willing to give that up because it wasn't going to be healthy for any of us. I like my privacy and sometimes there's no place to go. So I find myself going to the library for some quiet time. I didn't want to be, this is the part I love. I did not want to become that woman that people would talk about and say, look, she just gave up her whole life for those children and became bitter and resentful. And I go back to that Victor Frankl quote, right? In that space was her power to choose her response. And she did not want to be bitter and resentful. And um, uh, she became um, incredibly adaptable. And she had kids stuff all over the house. And they would tell her she was too fancy and <laughs> break up all her stuff. And, you know, um, Four kids on the spectrum who just lost their mother and in some ways their father, um, that, that's, that's a lot. And so, oh yeah, so I, I didn't see that I had my thought about her in writing. I choose willing to walk a different path and to do it with creativity. She also practiced a lot of what we talked about, including self-care. So um, I added one last little quote. And this is from a woman, I think she had been, I know she'd been in the military and I think she has twins on the spectrum. And she said, um, I think the greatest thing about my children is they forced me to become creative and I didn't have a creative bone in my body. And the last thing I wanna say, I think it's my last thing, is uh, I, um, I know, not just me, and you see it with all these people, we are wired to be adaptable. Um, there are ways to do it. I try to highlight many of the strategies that help. But if you think about it, these are not handpicked extraordinary people. They're everyday people that either they knew in daily life or they came from Craigslist or they saw a note on the internet. And if you look, I think Albert Einstein was right that everybody has some genius strategies. And if you look, like the man whose wife died suddenly and he couldn't communicate with his son, you know, and, and he was kind of a work a day guy working a hundred miles from the home who just decided, I, I need to have a good life with these kids and I'm going to figure it out. And that's what I meant by walking the path. All right, the next slide, please. Oh, and that's just my contact information. So if you had a question about something, I said or such, and you write me out it's back. Okay. I can't. <laughs> Here you go. Uh, okay. Wow, Dr. Marshak, that was phenomenal. Um, before I forget, uh, from what I understand, Amazon is a little bit low on stock for your book. Uh, what that, yeah, Woodbine House just um, it gave me the rights back to the book, saying with finances, they couldn't do another printing and they're out of stock. So there may be some left on Amazon. I'm eventually going to put it back on 
Amazon, but there may still be some. And I also own some, like a whole extra carton. So if somebody really, really, uh, or even really wanted it, it doesn't have to be really, really, uh, I'd be happy to send it to you at my cost, which is probably about $18 or something like that. But I will say, you know, of all the books I've written, I was just so impressed with um, people's lives and what they wanted to share. So, yeah. So you can get it one way or the other if you really want it. Thank you so much. Um, we're going to uh, have some time to do some Q&A with Dr. Marshak now. Uh, I've got a whole slew of questions that Angela uh, thankfully helped me brainstorm uh, the other day. But if anybody has specific questions for Dr. Marshak, please, um, I can bring you on. This is being recorded. I can bring you on or you can just type it in the chat, whichever you prefer. Um, but I don't, I don't want to hog all the time. Uh, she's, she's here for you guys. So pick a brain. Um, and while people are, are thinking and ruminating, I, uh, <laughs> You know, pulling it all together, Dr. Marshak, um, I just see clearly, clearly the need for a support system. Okay. It's, it's like almost even more fundamental than self-care because you may not be able to get the self-care without the support system. Um, but then, you know, you run into the issue, like you said, you know, trusting somebody there. My son has Duchenne muscular dystrophy and there are plenty of people who um, it's just it's he, the, the child is so medically fragile and you would hate to go do some self-care. And on that time, your child breaks a femur or, um, you know, the autism and the violence that goes hand in hand. That's so hard. Um, and I, I'm not sure what I'm asking here, but maybe maybe brainstorming like some of the details, some of those spaces in between for. So the I, I understand the question, okay. and so when I think about support, I think about, and when I think about self care, I think we have to be creative about those. So, um, so when I think about self-care for a minute. We can do something about our sleep. Even kids, I've worked a number of times with families like whose um, kids had trachs and machines and had to be watched all night long. So I understand what you're talking about, but then you work within those confines around self-care, right? And sleep is part of self-care. Connection with others is self-care which can also be they're coming to your house or you meeting online, right? It, it's working within the parameters. And so, um, so I'm not saying with any of this, just have a good friend watch your child when some of the risks are realistic. However, um, I, I think that is a value about um, being connected with some of the parents like, in your case, you sheds that really understand the complexities. So, and then the other way that a support system factors in is they sometimes know resources. So another mother, let's say with new sheds, might know a source of respite care of well-trained people where you would not have to be as fearful. And it's like Sam finding about the camera system from another parent, right? He, um, so that's the other reason why a support network is so good because we can brainstorm with them. Yeah. That, Yes, yes, and I, and I love that you brought up the respite because this is something, you know, Angela and I were talking about, uh, at, at least here in, in Texas, if you are lucky enough to have your child approved for, um, you know, benefits from the government, um, <laughs> you know, uh, the pay that the respite 
providers get is less than minimum wage. My nephew can earn more than that pushing carts at HEB. Um, and so it's just, it, it seems like almost like the world is just closing in on you, particularly if you, um, you know, if you're the sole provider for your own finances and for your child, then. I, I um, agree with you. <clears throat> However, <clears throat> and those are all realistic. Okay. Uh, and I may have mentioned this when I did uh, the marriage talk, but what came to mind was a couple I was seeing who had a child where the seizures were that life threatening and, mm. and maybe had 30 or 40 a day <sighs> that they could never leave their son with anybody. And I probably mentioned in that talk. So what they did is they did these really romantic in-home dates. And that was creative and that's what they did because it was not realistic to look at respite or look at having a friend or a family member watch their child. So that's what I mean by you, you take the concept and then you figure it out, but, but you figure it out with the brain power of other people in that situation, right? And that is why support groups like you're doing or others on the web are so important. That's fantastic. It's it's another version of keeping your eye on the prize, right? It's <laughs> on mine. Absolutely, because so many of those parents were, right? This is not the path I expected or wanted. And how do you expect me to walk this well with this obstacle and this thrown in my path? And right. Um, but then, right. You figure it out the best you can because the alternative is not. Yeah. So the prize is, is more the life that you want. Yeah. Um, if we could switch gears for, for a second and talk about the parent child relationship. Yes. Um, I know for a lot of kids with disabilities, they're particular about the way things are done. <laughs> Uh, and even with with myself, I'm I'm married, and my kiddo still um, asks for me every night to fix his blankets in a very specific way. And you know, we've been working with dad can do it; it's okay. You know, getting getting another caregiver in there. And you know, I was I was reflecting with Angela about God. What if you physically don't have another adult in the family? Um, to kind of come in, you know, how, how enmeshed that relationship can get and dependent child and, um, and parent that who, who they're with primarily. Can you talk about that anymore? Yeah. Um, so, and some of you may have ideas too. Uh, because I don't claim to have a full answer it, but but I have the mindset I would bring to it is, oh, you know, I didn't talk about the serenity prayer, which I always say wrong if I have to do it on the spot, right? But I just change the things I can change and serenity, except the things I can't and the wisdom to know the difference. So um, you can't change whether or not there's another person to help sometimes. But probably the part you can change is um, carving out some personal space. So if that child wants to go their side, most always, there's usually some room to say, you know, mommy will come in a bit, but right now I'm doing a 20 minute yoga tape that I can hear you from my room, right? It, it's the more, that you can work within those confines to differentiate a little. And I also believe, yeah, in letting go other things that you need to let go of, right? If you have limited energy and have to conserve it. But the other piece, I think, you know, when I had that good question, which had to do with about not parentifying another uh, child, which is part of this, if there are other people you're connected to and can at least talk to, whether or not you can go to their yard and eat watermelon, some of you can, and maybe you can bring your son and go, right? 
it's it's a way to differentiate to have more of a personal adult life that does not revolve around your child. Um, I don't know how else to answer that, um, but it, it's where you take that freedom where you can and that space because you're, you're right about enmeshment and um, some of it, um, some is unavoidable, not all of it. I'm seeing a common theme here, Dr. Marshak, uh, creativity. <laughs> You know, it is, and it's that old cliche that I'll mod I modify, where there's will, there's a way. It's where there's a will, there's some strategies, <laughs> whether or not it's a complete way, right? There's some strategies that will help. Oh, that's wonderful. Will, there's room for improvement. Yeah, yeah. Whether or not it's a full fix. <laughs> um, I'd love to talk about that a little bit more about, um, the other siblings, mm -hmm. um, you know, in, in our marriage talk, I loved how you had that, that pie and, and you know, the, the child with a disability is only this much of the whole pie. Um, but gosh, when it's just you on, on your own and you've got maybe two, you know, a child with a disability, a child without, it's, I, I would imagine it's so easy to either push that child without a disability into a parent role or, you know, un unconsciously, of course, right. Um, right. Or um, just have to devote so much time to the child with disability that, you know, the neurotypical child is overlooked. How, how do you not lose? How do you, how do you parent your, your neurotypical so, child? Yeah. Um, so being aware that this needs to be done um, helps people be more mindful of it. And I'm speaking, so, um, I'm thinking it through for a moment. So if um, the fact that that is so much on your radar screen, probably, um, will lead you um, to give it second and third and fourth thought at times when you're asking a typical sibling to help. Mm -hmm. um, there are times you may want to shrink up time from the child with a disability mm -hmm. and make sure and devote it to the other. So part is a consciousness to not let this get too unbalanced rather than going into the mindset of there's nothing I can do. And um, there's a lot written about uh, what it's like to be, um, and it's different in different families, to be the sibling uh, of a child with a disability or illness that takes a lot of attention. And, and reading about it and thinking about it makes it easier to be very aware. The other piece is, and I don't know if we talked about it last time, about sibling support groups. Mm. Do you know about Myers? Did we talk about that? I don't think we did. Oh. So um, Don Myers, I think it's M-Y-E-R-S, I want to say 15 years ago, uh, recognized this need in families and started sibling support groups for uh, typical siblings who were struggling with this issue. It doesn't mean parents shouldn't change, but... Um, It'd be easy to find on the web and there's so much more being offered to siblings and not that we should farm it out outside of our home, but that um, the unique position a sibling without a disability in really does need to be respected and thought about. And um, my guess is, and I've known a lot of families in this situation, It's not inevitable uh, that the typical sibling um, uh, has to feel resentment or um, parentified like they lost their childhood. Um, in fact, I just got a, a Christmas card from somebody. I have to de-identify it. 
uh, whose son is very med medically fragile. And um, uh, that's an example of someone who really kept uh, the typical sibling from having to be over involved. And he was just said to picture the kid and all a, a typical one, all his adventures, and just, you know, making sure to focus on it. So it's possible. It's just not easy. <sighs> But, but uh, let me add, it's not easy, but I think it's essential because um, when the typical child is not protected from too much parent parentification, or if they have to downplay their accomplishments, yeah. uh, because the other one, uh, it really creates problems for them. That's a different kind of a need. Yeah. Um... Could I say something? Oh, please. I, I, <laughs> so my son's about to be 14. I have found there are times he's very demanding and that's a normal 14 year old. Like I have talked to my therapist and she's like, that's a normal kid. You, you, you can set boundaries. I know they're medically fragile, but guess what? When he demands, like, just to use your example, come fix my blanket. You could possibly say, no, fix your you own, right. you know what I mean? And, and you you'll right. find out that they adjust. Because I've been trying to treat him, you know, when you're 14, you're pulling away from your parents anyway, you want to be independent, and I'm trying not to smother him, he's the only son I have, so I'm like, oh my, and the therapist is like, no, don't get played, not to say, I know autistics can be very demanding, but sometimes you can just say, bad for them, boundary, boundaries, yeah, you know, I'm so glad you said that, because I didn't say boundary, and boundary is the word, you and can do your yoga, Mom's Absolutely. doing yoga. Yeah. Back off. Yeah. It, it's so much better for their development. I'm they so want to know who's that. driving the ship. They want to know it's not right. them. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I'm so glad you said it. And it also applies to attention for siblings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? There are other people in this family. Yeah. You said it. Thank you. You're welcome. Could also add to the conversation. Sure. Um, so, Dr. Marshak, I recognize you from uh, was here the last seminar. Yeah, yeah. And so, yeah. So, so my story is that I have two special needs um, children, different ends of the spectrum, and having gone through the challenges of, of divorce, I actually decided to you know, focus on the positive and help others going through the process. So that's what I do. And so um, to answer your, your question about you know, how to deal with bedtime routines and all the changes that might happen and all the demands on your time, um, for one, I totally echo the self-care and the boundaries. I think um, you know, recognize going through the process that I didn't have those and make those a priority. And I think those are very important. Um, but in terms of um, having to then switch gears and figure out how to do these things on my own, like say the bedtime routine. Um, one is having more structure and more boundaries saying, well, you know, I can, um, you know, help in this area. Sometimes, um, you know, maybe dad did a certain role and now we're having to do it. Well, we're maybe we have to do it differently or change the time, or like you said, um, expect more of the other person. I found what helped me go through the process and help my kids was creating social stories. So those could take, those could be verbal, those could be ones that you create on your own, written with pictures, whatever level your child may be at. But those help um, also to explain what's happening in the whole process of the transition, the divorce, and that helps the kids a lot. And then I also wanted to add that, um, you know, because you went from two people doing, you know, two full-time um, jobs and focus on the child, um, to one, sometimes you do need extra help. And so don't be afraid to ask for help. To, I've had to hire some people sometimes used to be to help, you know, with the routines and in the morning, sometimes in the evening. And it, it's been a great help. And, they, and even in one case, um, you know, one person even trained uh, my son to do more tasks independently. So that helps offload me. And then my other son, who's higher functioning, would also help. But like you said, you don't want them to become the adult. And sometimes you remind them, I'm the parent, I'm the adult, this is my job. So um, I think that's 
really helpful. And as you were speaking, I was thinking, uh, you know, as much as you heard me say, all of you, about resilience and adapting kids too, that we, we can raise the bar of, of some of the ways we um, need to help our kids adapt to new structure and aspects of new life. I think you said it beautifully. And they do attempt to take some time and it's hard for everybody, yeah. you know, the parents and the children, but eventually, you know, you do. This is the new normal and you have to work up to that, but this is, you know, this is how it is now. And to me, I think you also described being a leader and having a vision for how you want daily family life to be. And then you put some healthy changes in place with good supports. Right. Because I recognize, you know, at one point it became too much. I was like, I, I do need help. So you, 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 know, you, you yeah. know, get to a point where you're like, okay, it's, it's, it's too much. And so, yeah. you know, hopefully people have the resources. But if you don't, there's other ways. But um, yeah, I felt that that takes a huge load and stress off of me and brings down the stress and, and anxiety in the entire household. If you can have just a little bit of help or just take a break, like I said, a mental break, a self-care break, whatever it might be, focus on yourself, take some downtime, like you're saying about the yoga and so on. Um, yeah, all those things definitely, definitely help. And let some things fall by the wayside. Right. That's true too. I don't watch TV anymore. <laughs> or clean house or no. <laughs> that's true. That's true. That's a challenge. There are things we cannot do. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Let's see. Uh, thank you so much for that. Um, and actually that that brought to mind um, some few other few other questions. Um, <laughs> Dr. Marshak, it seems like there are so many essentials uh, in, in this particular situation, um, but, you know, some of our kids have um, genetic diseases, and um, if, if you're in the situation of a divorce, you might have a spouse blaming you for the divorce. You might have a child blaming you for their disabilities. Um, could we talk maybe about unique concerns for mental health for a solo parent? Yes. So I'm trying to think about how um, to do it in a, a limited <laughs> period because that's a very large topic. Yep. Um, I'm a huge fan of therapy and I think, um, and I've often used it as a tool myself, even though I've been a psychologist for 35 years, because we often need one other person that we can say anything to that can help us with that. And sometimes that's different than, than a friend. And um, <clears throat> so, and you're absolutely right. <clears throat> being in a position, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, that you may be being blamed <clears throat> for water's for. You may have a lot of <clears throat> blame and fear and a lot of other emotions coming towards you. <clears throat> and as much as, sorry. Take your time. <laughs> <clears throat> My throat must have run out of words, which is unusual for me. But um, so I absolutely uh, believe in therapy. I think with telehealth, it's not that it's always that easy to get. There are so many people looking for therapists, but telehealth, I think, does make it easier right now, especially if you can't leave the home. So um, uh, that to me is really, really important. I think being aware of um, the prevalence of depression and anxiety disorders. Um, being aware that you're of what is grief and what is depression, um, knowing when your thoughts turn scary, what to do. So, um, uh, so that's part of it. Um, and the other part really is self-care, like meditating and other things, but it doesn't, there are times, right? There are things that are prophylactic that can help keep us weller, right? Um, social support, 
sleep, self-care, um, counseling. Um, and the other part is um, understanding that stress does raise the probability of more mental health problems. And there are a lot of strong people in life that can end up having some suicidal thinking um, or impulses or plans, even though they've always been well grounded and strong, that um, depression changes our thought process so much um, uh, that we need to stay on top of that. And often that is with professional help. Um, and uh, you know, my other thought is this, you know, and I think we talked about it before, you know, I very much believe in uh, the power of exercise and friends and coping and meditation and prayer for some people. I, I, that's all really important. There are also times for medication, right? Uh, 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 if you are struggling uh, with depression that does not respond to other things with, with anxiety disorders. Um, there are a lot of parents or some parents of kids um, with disabilities or life-threatening illnesses that have PTSD from all these experiences. And um, uh, that merits professional help. Um, yeah, so that's my thinking about it. And I always take it seriously, even when I'm um, with somebody who I admire for their coping, I don't, uh, everybody sometimes has their um, breaking points where it becomes too much. And that holds true for children too. Oh, that's, that's, a, that's a heavy topic. Hopefully we can get into that more at, a, at another time. Um, I have a, uh, just two more, two more questions, and they're kind of in the same vein. Um, before I do that, I see um, Madeline, you're unmuted. Do you have a question, or is it technical, <laughs> technical complications? I know it's not always easy over there. Okay. Well, if you're just listening, feel free to um, to uh, post a message or something if you'd like to chat. Uh, so, gosh. Um, <laughs> I don't mean to uh, end on such a on such a um, depressing topic, but uh, in the event of having to terminate some relationships, um, you know, and, and my two thoughts are, um, you know, if if you if you decide that the co-parenting or the co-partner isn't fit. Mm -hmm. anymore or um you know I've got a friend who sends her autistic son over to um you know the dad's house for visitation and the child comes home and he hasn't had his medication you know um he's been doing video games and he's just kind of strung out from all of the screen time um sometimes he's eaten sometimes he hasn't you know <laughs> How do you even begin <laughs> to tackle that? Um, and then I'll save my next question after we do this one. This seems like a big, big chunk. Yeah. So I won't be at, um, not going to be, because I don't have a legal background, right? So I won't be a full expert on this. Um, and, but I do know this runs on a continuum. Right. So the first choice is, can you work with that parent in a way, like that Betsy did in a way, that gets them to basic acceptable level, which would be food and medication. And if the child's on screen too much, I would put that in the category, better off they have a relationship with that parent. And so, and... Um, I've dealt with this a lot with many clients I've had with kids on the spectrum uh, where the fights become uh, when they're married and also when they're divorced. Um, but this is how we need to do it for the child. And so it's the issue of which ones to let go. 
I would let go of screen time. That's not preferable, but I'd let go of it. Medication is a maybe. It depends on what it's a medication for, right? I'm not saying it's it's a good situation, but I would use Betsy skills to try to get that and not talk about the screen time. But the other part is, uh, if it's worse than that, and you think a child's unsafe, I would consult an attorney who understands the things about custody and visitation that I don't. But right, it'd be worth the consultation of do I have any legal rights here? And um, because I would never risk a child being unsafe 